This is Connie Mason. It is March 31st, Thursday, 2011. I will be interviewing, this is the second interview with Miss Maddie G. Willis at the Corsound Waterfowl Museum. Make sure my microphone's working nicely now. Oh, and this is Miss Maddie Willis. Now, Miss Maddie, tell me your full name. Maddie Gray Willis. Willis? Willis Willis. <laughs> okay. And um, tell me uh, where you were born. I was born here at Harkins Island at home. Um, mother had four children. She had the first and last in Beaufort. And the two middle ones she had here on the island at home. Did she have a, was there a midwife here on the island? Yeah. Um, Margaret Willis was the one on the west end of the island. Annie Rose was the midwife on the east end. Uh -huh. but, um, they were good. I don't know that they had had any training whatsoever. But they were always called, and they moved in the house with the family, usually, if they lived far from where the family was. They would move in like maybe a week before and just be with the family because the, the mom was kind of not bedridden, but she wasn't, didn't do a whole lot around the house. Then after the baby came, there were quilts put up to the windows, from what I understand, because the new baby wasn't supposed to have any light on its eyes, you know. They used to put brown liquid in the baby's eyes. I don't know if they do that anymore. But the, uh, the granny woman stayed there, the midwife, and took care of the family and the mom and the baby. And they usually made them stay in bed like 10 days before they let them get up, which was a no-no now. Oh, yeah. But my next-door neighbor, I remember, we were children, and the next-door neighbor, she stayed in bed with one of hers to the 10th day, and her mom let her get up, and she had a cerebral hemorrhage and died. Oh, so I don't know if it was right after that or what. Uh, when they started letting them get up earlier, they found that that was best, you know, to get the blood the circulating. Blood flow. Whatever. Wow. And you and called her a granny? Some people call them grand. They call were called midwives, I guess. Midwives, but, but, I think but we granny, called them grannies. Granny. But she moved in. I uh, took care of the little one until I don't know ten days or whatever, until the mom was able. Of course, they were not allowed to wash clothes and that kind of stuff. What What was a brown liquid that they, you were talking about? Do you know? You know what that was made of? Was it a? Well, that was. I seen that to the hospital. When oh, my, that's now. When my okay. babies were coming, I yeah. don't know what if they used anything. But they, I know that the bright light was not supposed to be be good for them on their eyes. But um, and they got very, very little pay, if any. Um, maybe if the dad worked in the water, I suppose that he would bring seafood to them, and maybe the ones that were in the service or whatever, they may have paid them a little bit. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But they did all that for a little bit of nothing. I mean, and it was it was a big, big risk, you know, because I know that there was one or two of a year that had babies ran in difficulties with, uh, like, coming feet first or stuff like that. And they, mm -hmm. so they, uh, and in doing genealogy, I have found that a lot, there was a lot of moms that died at childbirth, and I wonder now it would be such a simple thing if they were in the hospital or whatever. Absolutely. So, uh, and what was your mom and dad's name? <clears throat> Daddy's name was Carl Macon Willis. Macon, M-A-C-O-N? Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And mom's name was Clara Bell Davis. Davis. Mm -hmm. Were they both from the island here, mm -hmm. the Harper's Island? Um, how did they meet? I think we talked about that. I don't know, really, how they met. Mother was a close friend with Edith Willis. I think she was a Guthrie. Uh, and they, like, ran around together. They lived in the same neighborhood. Now, Dad was from the west end of the island. I don't know how he got... <laughs> I guess they maybe had movies or fudge parties or something, and they just... I think that was the only one that Daddy ever dated for yeah. mother. And your daddy was in, was he a waterman first? Well, he had to stop school. And so many young people stopped school, especially the, the men or the boys, to help their dads. 
the dads didn't, not many had big boats. They just had little open boats and they went crabbing or clamming or whatever. And when the boys got old enough, they went with their dads. I remember one time my granddaddy left my daddy on a little island or whatever you called it and came home. And that night he realized that he had left. <laughs> And I remember Daddy saying that he yelled and yelled and yelled, but the wind was blowing in the opposite direction. So finally he realized, and he waded off to see if he could swim to the island from that little, because it wasn't, you know. Um, and he realized that the water got too deep, so he went back to the little island. And when Granddaddy realized what he had done, and he, Daddy said he, talking about lavishing somebody with love, he did it. But the little boys did. They had to quit most of them, quit work. And... But they finally found oh, yeah, yeah. The tide him. was getting high, but... Uh, he was losing ground. Yeah, so... But I find that every once in a while somebody will say that they did that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And if you had two or three people with you and you were out pulling your nest when you got the boat, whatever, you know, if it was clams or crabs, whatever, um, you just took off and you didn't check <laughs> <laughs> so did uh, and he eventually joined the service he joined the Coast Guard when he, he lied there was like six guys from here on the island and they got together and he used to talk about how they would go to churches when they were having a revival and they would go to the altar just to see the preacher if it was a woman <laughs> <laughs> but he said that they just were sitting around one evening in the summertime to the landing and one of them said let's go to the Coast Guard and they just took off, six of them, I think. It was Alan Lewis and Walter Lewis and a big bunch of them. They went all of them lied. And um, they all joined the Coast Guard. And I don't know if they even had boot camp or where the train, whatever. But um, Daddy loved to reminisce when we were little. But we should have kept right on questioning, you know, when they got older. He, they could have told us so much. Oh, yeah. Well, hindsight's twenty twenty. Yeah. A lot of people had that regret. But he went in the Coast Guard and, and he stayed for 27 years and wow. regretted getting out. And what about what year was that? It doesn't have to be exact, but about... When he got out? When he, when he got in, when he went I mean, in. I don't know. But it was I before was born, World War II. Well, I, yeah, my goodness, yes. Um, it had to be. He was in service a long time. I was born in 31, and he was at Fort Macon then. So he had been in for years before that. My oldest brother was born in 29. He was in the service then. So, so, uh. I don't know. I, he was probably, I can look in my records at home and see, but he was probably in the Coast Guard when he got married. I don't know for sure. Mm -hmm. And, uh, <clears throat> you told me that, uh, uh, part of the duties of the Coast Guardsman was to patrol the beach and you went on patrol oh, yeah. with him, didn't you? Mm -hmm. Every evening after they got the boat houses and everything cleaned down and got supper, they took their little things. They had a belt thing with things hanging on. I don't know what all. Like a utility and belt. And we would start walking, and we would have so much fun when we would go toward Atlantic Beach. I guess that's the west. And they had time clocks to the end, you know, and they had to... Uh, we would run and play in the waves and so forth, and Daddy was always checking to see, you know, what, if there was any signs of boats that come on the beach or anything. And when we got way down on Mustang Atlantic Beach, he'd hit that clock and make a record of it. Mm -hmm. Then we'd head on, and it was the far piece. I don't know how far it is from Atlantic Beach to Fort Macon. But we had such fun. We would play in the hills, and Daddy would play with us, and... I just enjoyed it. These were on the good nights, calm yeah. days, beautiful when days. When it was bad, of course, he wouldn't let us go because right. if it was stormy, yeah, the, the waves would come almost to the dunes. And that was dangerous. Yeah. Now, I suppose, if they had to do that, they would probably use a jeep or a truck or something. Yeah. Did uh, did it, Was he ever stationed at Cape Lookout? Yes. Mm -hmm. And that was fun, too. I mean... Um, Every evening, he would take us in the Coast Guard truck, and we would go to Corbanks, because they had a station in Corbanks now, I mean then. And he'd go down there to take the mail and supplies or whatever. Now, you, you told me something last time we talked uh, <clears throat> about there were no girls allowed in the station. Is that right? 
I don't know. All I remember about the state was being on the porch because they had long porches. And in the, uh, um, shoot, the room where they had the pool tables and tennis mm -hmm. tables and all that. We'd go there every afternoon. Recreational. Recreational room, mm -hmm. yeah. place. Um, that was kind of a little building off from the station. It was attached, mm -hmm. but it wasn't. Um, but I don't ever remember hardly going in the station at all. Of course, the cooking, little cook shed place was off from the station. Mm -hmm. But um, whenever there was a storm or something and they had people come in, they would evacuate the houses and we would go. But we weren't allowed all over. I mean, you just didn't go wandering. Where was Daddy being? He was the chief over there. He was the chief. Um, oh, okay. Um, we would go like in the kitchen then or wherever we needed to be, but we were not allowed just to run rampant, you know. Now, as as the chief's <coughs> family, where did you live? Oh. There's little cottages over there. Mm -hmm. And there was one, Uncle David and a lot of guys that went over there with their families. But we would stay weeks and weeks over there. And I think now... Uh, Is that cottage still there? I don't know. The last time I went, I didn't go any further than the lighthouse. No. Well, we need it was so it was so little area when you're little. I guess things look bigger, but to us it was. We would walk from the station to the lighthouse every morning and play. The Coast Guard had a little dock by the lighthouse, and the Army dock was on the other end. You know, mm -hmm. but um, I would take off mornings by myself and walk to the gun mines after when the war. We weren't allowed over there during the war, but after the war. And the gun mines were in the middle of the island, we called it. Now they're out in the ocean. Yeah. So yeah. it's washed away quite a bit. Do you, do you remember uh, when the gun mounts were moved into place? No, we weren't allowed over there, I don't think. Um, At that time? I think once the war started and, the, and the, there was so much turmoil... Even though as a child you were, I wasn't a child, I was 13 when the war started. Um, you got in their way and stuff, and there was always jeeps and trucks going and coming and stuff. So I don't know if we were banned, if the public was banned from over there or what, but I do remember that it was kind of a, you didn't even think of being in a little boat over that way. Oh, really? Yeah. And then um, when it really got rough, and the boats were being bombed, or the submarines, or whatever. I know that we went over there just about every Sunday evening to watch the ships burn, or whatever. Really? And to pick up, like, hay rations and paint and stuff that was on the beach. It seems to me that you would have been banned from that. I mean, it, I don't know that anybody were allowed to go in the waves or swim or anything. I don't remember that. But I do remember walking along the beach and picking up those kinds of things. But we went just about every Sunday and just sat on the hills and watched the... I don't know if there were ever, probably, there had been bodies picked up over there, I would think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I remember uh, other people telling me about finding bodies. That that had to be a very unpleasant. I didn't know if um, the fishing boats were even light out there. I, I don't know. It's probably, like, zoned off or whatever. Mm -hmm. Because that would have been a mess, too, if... The, they were out there fishing, and because I remember those tankers, those big boats, they were close to shore burning. It seemed like, yeah, and all that was classified. Though. The rest of the nation did not know that was happening Didn't they? off our coast. Now I don't remember if it was if there was any that way. Core banks, they were not. Yeah, they had some too. Yeah, yeah, but it was all classified, and the people like Raleigh, they didn't even know some things like that were happening. I think now. Um, they couldn't couldn't keep it a secret now, of course. <laughs> I remember the the army trucks being over here um, with groups of, I guess men. I don't know how many they would bring, but um, they would ship. They'd go over there, and I guess they patrol the beaches. I don't know, mm -hmm. but I remember how we had to cover our windows and we'd go upstairs when it started getting dark and be like, you know, Anne Frank. They had that little, it was sort of like that. You weren't allowed to have it. We had little tiny candles burning, but we weren't allowed to have bright lights. You had to cover and your windows. Even you? the cars that went down the road had to have tape over their lights, just a little tiny slit. 
Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it was scary, but I suppose now it would be even scarier. Now, your father had to go overseas too, didn't he? He went overseas for two years. And what was his job? He drove one of the landing crafts that went to carry the troops to the beaches, which was very dangerous. And we didn't... We then didn't realize how serious things were. After he came home, I think I might have told you this before, he would try to tell us things that happened to him, and we laughed about it and thought it was, you know. But then later on, we and I think about it now, he, he said that when they were taking the troops to the beach, see, all the fire was coming toward them. The Japanese were firing at them. And how dangerous it was. And he said before they get to the beach to put the the landing thing down for the troops to go off, the Japanese would be firing right at them. So they'd stop way before they got to the beach, and they sometimes had to push these little young guys overboard, you know. And it would be over their heads, and they would have to push them. And how how heartbreaking that was. There's little teenagers, it seemed like. And they'd beg for your helmet if they had lost theirs overboard or something. And then they'd have to turn around and get another group and carry them back. So it was a... And how they had when they got, because at the time he was over there, I didn't know if it, it was in the Philippines, um, how they would have to, if they got damages to their boat, because they had the kamikaze then, or whatever mm-hmm. you call it, and they would try to to crash in the boats, the ships. But um, how they'd have to shoot if, a, if an airplane, a Japanese, whatever, um, crashed near the boats, the Troops, you know, they're going to try to swim to the closest. They would try to get close to the ship, and they'd shoot them before. They weren't allowed to take them as prisoners because they didn't have room. Oh, wow. So it, it, it was a hard happened. time, wasn't it? It was. Mm. And um, I don't think at the time it was such a quick thing if they had time to even think. Yeah. Because their daddy's ship was in Norfolk being done over, whatever you call it. And when they got the call... Because they had to come all the way around here, Florida and all that, to get to California where they were shipping out. So they had to go through the uh, Panama Canal? Mm-hmm. He bought souvenirs home. Of, but um, Fort Macon Coast Guard at, over there called Mother and the families of the boys that were on the ships. Um, they were coming a convoy and said to be to Fort Macon by like 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock, whatever. So all the women over here that had children, they tried to get carloads, and we, know, and we stood on the beach, and we saw the outline. It was like a shadow way off. And we still didn't know what was happening. All of a sudden, these barges started coming ashore, and it was the guys that had families on the beach, which they couldn't stay for like half an hour or whatever. But at least they were kind enough to let oh, them do that. That was great, yeah. So then we went on home, and the ships took off, and... We didn't hear any more until they got to California. Mm. And most of the letters the guys wrote home had to be censored. So they couldn't write, you know, certain things. Yeah, I bet the person who had to, the censor who had to read all those letters, that must have been something. And anything, I mean, they didn't miss a thing if they put anything in those letters. It was a to back down. Mm-hmm. But after, and then after he got out of the, after the war was over, did he go back and he was still in the service? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Let's see, they, uh, I think they came home on a train. And we didn't know they were coming. I was to my aunt's house having dinner that Sunday, and we were out in the yard playing, and Aunt Blanche came around and, get your things together, we've got to go, got to go to your house, your daddy's on his way home. And when we got home, because we had to walk, we got home and daddy was there, and all of the neighborhood had gathered. It was a big thing. Now I don't know if the service may get any recognition, but he was like a hero. And I remember he went to the store a day or two after that. And an old woman that was here, she came in, Aunt Lady. She said, Carl, you stay home all the time. Every time I come to this store, you're here. And it had been two years <laughs> since he had been home. He was kind of insulted <laughs> that he hadn't been missed. <laughs> in two years he hadn't been missed. Yeah. Well, that, that would be he tells the most. He did tell the most things about how the prisoners, do you care if I... No, I'd love for you to tell that. How the prisoners, they would have them in 
like pen, pig pen or something. And he, because Daddy was a very emotional person, but he would tell about how he would walk along the edge and those guys would cry, wanted to tell somebody about their situation, the ones that were in the prisoners, Japanese, most of them, and how they'd cry and tell about how they were forced. They were, they were young men. Like the army had draft here. Mm-hmm. Well, that's he said they would cry and say they didn't want to be in the war and all that stuff. And now here they are as prisoners. I don't know what ever happened to the prisoners. Well, <clears throat> eventually they were were let go. I mean, uh, that I don't. There wasn't any big uh, war crimes trials like there were in Germany uh, for the Japanese. That but, I um, and then he would talk sometimes and cry about how humble and good the people in the Samoan Islands and he was, the different islands they went to how how good the people were and how good the coast guard or the service men were treated. Mm-hmm. I know he was trying to find somebody that was a member of his church because he wanted to go to Sunday school if there was. So he went down the beach one day singing a song that's in our church hymnals and an old man came up to him and said that's my song. So he took it. Do you remember what song it was? I think it was Come, Come, You Saints. Oh, I'm not okay. sure. But, um, you know, I've often heard that if you're in a, anywhere like that and you're in a strange place, um, to hum a song or something and they would recognize you. Know. Mm-hmm. But um, he said the Samoan people were the best people on earth. And and his uh, religion <coughs> was Mormon? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But um, he said, that, and I've often heard that the Samoan, they call them now Samoan Americans. But, um, he he enjoyed, he said that the New Zealand people were real good too. Mm-hmm. They bought pictures home. Huh? And most of them were older, mm-hmm. older people. So, so he came back home to a hero's welcome. And uh, now when did he meet your mother? Was it after, I mean, it, that was, I mean, he was married before he went to war. Oh yeah. And so when he came back home, now had had he they had all their children by then? Oh or? yeah. Uh, no. Well, yeah. Miles was the youngest. He was born in nineteen forty. So that was before. Daddy that. left. He was a, he wasn't even walking, and he had to pull off and leave mother with all those children. And see, it happened so quickly. Like I said before, that they didn't have time to make plans mm-hmm. or arrangements. Mm-hmm. Left mother with four. I guess that she continued to get his pay. I, I suppose she did. But it was kind of hard. Mm-hmm. And everything was rationing during the war. I mean, you only got a little bit of this and a little bit of that. And Where were you living? Same place on the west end of the island. On the west end of Harvard's Island. She had, they had a big home, and grandmother lived not too far from. So she took help mother a lot and take care of the little ones. Is that, is that home still there today? Mm-hmm. And it would be right before the sharp curve. Is that when you come coming or going? When you're coming on the island. Yeah, it's just before you hit the sharp curve. And it's on the left hand side. Now, our grandmother's house was around where the new housing, all that stuff is. We called that um, the fresh. What was that called then? I can't remember. She had an old big house, but Granddaddy had died then, so she was by herself. So, um, and we had lamp lights and that kind of you know, street lights. What What would be your favorite type of meal that your mom would fix for you? Stewed chicken. Stewed chicken. <laughs> and grandmother would go out every every Saturday evening and kill the chicken, wring its neck, and it would finally die. Oh. And they had, didn't have any ice box, so nobody had. You had to deliver the ice here by the time you got it from Buffer here, it was melted. That was the only time you had like Jello or something cold. Um, so that, stewed chicken, what would she put in it? Anything? Or? She just had Dodgers and dumplings, and we'd always have stewed chicken, potato salad. And the beans, most of the beans, we got like green beans or whatever we can. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So, but they canned all summer. Yeah, the women did. What what kind of things did they can? They canned everything before they kind of stopped canning when everything got more. Yeah, manufactured. Yeah, um, it's a lot it, of work. 
And there was people over here that had gardens, but everything they got, um, they canned. Just before it stopped, uh, the people canning so much. The last thing they were going to try were collards. Oh, canning and, uh, collards. I remember uh, Helen Lewis and a bunch got together and said, we'll try those. And I never did find out how they were. I think Helen's is still up. I know when Mother died, she still had canned figs and that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Right on that until she got old, old, old. I, I uh, had Maybe the privilege of talking to David <clears throat> Yeomans' wife. Clara? Yeah, uh, many years ago. And after I talked with her, she gave me a thing of homemade canned figs. And I still have them. David? I never opened them. I said, that is precious to me. David, uh, Mother had a little sugar fig. Oh, I love those little And she, they cooked oh. those whole, and they put a slice of lemon mm. in them, or orange, and they were so pretty, but they were good in the wintertime of the hot white roll. Mm. <laughs> now, some of the bigger figs, you cut them in pieces, uh, but it took so much sugar. Well, I know uh, now there was, there was a fig recipe from Portsmouth that was kind of unusual because um, the woman who told me this, she said they had those big... Figs, I guess they were turkey figs uh, or something. They were purple. She said they had to milk the figs first. They had so much latex in them or white sap in them. You know, when you cut a fig, sometimes that out of stem. Oh, so most of that is in the stem, you know. Mm -hmm. And she says that they had to milk them first, get the milk out of them. I never heard that. I, I hadn't either. I cut it and just peel it off. Right, right. But um, they had pears, which were delicious. Mm. Those white pears, because everybody just about had pear trees and stuff. You know, I remember um, an old lady telling me one time that we know that Harker's Island is straight, so that was all one, it was all one land, one land thing. Anyway, that because straits could grow such pretty gardens, people on the island didn't. I mean, they had a little garden. But they said if Harker's Island and straits was all one, the property on the that side of the island ought to be as rich and good for planting as straits. So, and they found out that, especially on the west end of the island, they grew pretty colors and mm -hmm. stuff. Mm -hmm. So, but I don't know. They, like I said, anything they thought they could can, they would try. Right, right. I don't know if they ever tried like shrimp or anything like that. I don't know if any kind of seafood would would be cannibal. Uh, usually they, they salted the fish. Yeah, Mother always Did you have salt had, fish? I never ate any, but they, <laughs> all, they always had, they called it a lard can. It was cans that the stores had, that when the groceries were brought to the stores, they bought it all in one big can, you know, molasses or that came in tubs or whatever. But they would save the cans for the people. That wanted them. And Mother and most of the people used those cans to salt their fish. Oh, okay. And and they used them until the salt rested on that or whatever. But I remember Mother fixing them all the time. Sometimes she'd boil them, and sometimes she would put them in the oven. And like, this was after they came out of, the, out of the tub. Yeah, you took them out and let them dry or whatever. And they had the fish roe. That I love those. So you like mullet roe? Oh, yeah. The little ones I don't like great. But see, when I was little... They didn't cook them fresh like I want them now. They always dried them out, mm -hmm. put them in the sun between two mm -hmm. boards. Outdoors, I don't know why they didn't die of some kind Because there was insects flying around. But I never heard of anybody cooking one raw, we call it. Now, I, if I get one, I put it in the freezer, and if I want it, I'll take it out and wash it, salt it, and let it sit for a while. Mm -hmm. But all I ever saw were the dark colored ones they dried. Mm -hmm. Well, there's a man, that man to uh, Betty, the collar chap. He has yeah. dried like dried them. fish roe. I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. I I I buy some because I put put one on my dad's grave. I think I told you that before. No. You know, and because uh, he loved it so good. Now your daddy was from from Stacy. I still say Dionese, but yeah, yeah, and. Uh, so, so, but I never acquired a taste for it, but boy, he loved I it. I would eat those. Morning. Ooh, my grandmother used to cook those. 
whenever she knew that mother was coming. That was part of the supper. Mm -hmm. But um, I love the other kind, but I only want one little piece. So go on yeah, yeah. You told me about a chocolate cake that made my mouth water the <laughs> last time we talked. Tell me about that again. I don't know. There are a lot of people that still cling to the old recipes, which I had rather. There's a chocolate cake, and some make six layers, some make eight layers, little tiny ones. Mother always made the little ones, and she made her fudge frosting, they called it. And you could hear it crack in the head of the knife when she cut it. But they made um, jelly cake, which was in a tub. It wasn't like the jelly you get now. No taste whatsoever like it used to be. <laughs> and um, banana cake and pineapple cake. But they didn't make them like they make them now. Everything now I call it artificial. Mother would work all day Saturday fixing that cake. Mm. Uh, but it was made from scratch. There was no bought and put, uh, cake mix or icing and all that stuff. They made it. And I remember coming up, um, if we made pota uh, mashed potatoes or whatever, about making mashed potatoes now. We didn't have butter. It was white. We'd get it white. And there was a little bubble in it, a little peel, we called it. And you smash that with yellow, fla uh, yellow coloring. And you, I always smashed it with a fork, and I'd mix that yellow in with it. But there was no yellow butter. It was white. It, looked awful. it, it was margarine. Well, yeah, I'm sorry. It looked just like And it. Daddy called it axle grease. <laughs> <laughs> Until you got it colored. Nobody dared eat it because it was white. <laughs> Now, because Daddy was in the Coast Guard, we fared a little bit better because Daddy would... Stuff that they would throw out or were going to, Daddy would bring them, which is perfectly mm -hmm. good. Mm -hmm. That because they had an abundance of it, you know, Daddy would say, I'm going to take some of this home. So we fared a little bit better. Mm -hmm. But it, it was... And we always had one night Mother made fudge. We didn't have... Like I, I think I told you before... Daddy always said you were supposed to eat 8, 12, and 5, whether you were hungry or not. He died believing that. And I did to a certain extent and tried to hold on to that heritage until my children were in high school. But then I said, Daddy, the thing is now I've got a daughter in basketball practice. I've got a boy in football practice. I've got a boy at East Carver and a girl. You can't do the things that he grew up with and we grew up with as children. And that was, it was sad because the families got tore out back then. But um, we didn't have potato chips and popcorn. If you had popcorn, I don't remember even having popcorn when we were little. But, um, so there was no snacking in between. And you could eat eight because you were starved by 12, <laughs> you know. <laughs> you right. came running to the ice if you were to the shore, you know, because you were hungry. Because you were hungry. Well, now, uh, now, tell me about your husband. What about him? <laughs> well, just uh, his name and when uh, you met. And... Um, his name was Louis Willis. Everybody called him Blackie. Uh, he was almost next door neighbor, and we grew up together. We played together and everything, but I didn't even recognize him as somebody else. He was part of the family almost. Until I was out of high school. I was walking home from the movies one night, and he stopped. He was in the Coast Guard then. He said, hey, sweetie, or something like that. He said, you want to ride home? And I got in the car with him, and he asked me for a date that night. We had known each other all our lives, but he said, see, he'd been gone. I saw a picture of Chicken McComico, Lighthouse, um, Coast Guard base. I guess it was down around Oak Creek, somewhere down that way. Avon. Last Avon. night, it wasn't. And I said, how in the world did he ever learn to spell that? <laughs> That's a long <laughs> word. But um, we started dating, and... He stayed in for his four years, and I begged him to stay. Of course, he was a buoy jumper, which was kind of dangerous. Oh. They'd go up to the side of a buoy, and he'd have to jump it to get on the buoy. Oh. And they would take off and leave the ship, with the conifer or whatever boat he was on. They'd take off and just leave him on the buoy to make repairs or do whatever. And one day, they came to pick him up, and it was real rough, and the ship hit him on his knee and kind of busted it anyway. Oh. He went through life with a kind of a... Her knee, they'd have to uh, put needles in and draw the fluid, fluid on it. Mm. 
But I wanted him to stay in because Coast Guard had always been in my family. Every man in my family, daddy's family, mother's family, had been Coast Guard and retired, most of them. But his mom was hell bent. She was going to get him out. So he got out, but after six months, he was sorry he got out. Because um, if you weren't a fisherman back then, you were nothing. Did he turn to fishing when he when he got out? Of the no, he went to work for House of Paul in both House, oh, of, Paul House of Paul. Paul. Mm-hmm. And he worked with him and did his what you call it they like schooling thing. What was it called? Anyway, he got paid a little check for. Let's see. He had a he uh, he had a, a metal place, right? Turned metal House of Paul did. No, it's car repair. Well, car, car repair. Yeah, 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 yeah. It was down there where Beaufort. Uh, Right, so I don't know. It's the drugstore that's down the street. Bell's Drug. It's close to that, yeah. So it was, it was on the there. water side of the... Yeah, thing. he was uh, He was right next to Woodard. See the dentist? Woodard's house was next Woodard to was across the street, I think. Uh, House of Paul, the place right. the part where the men work was across the street. Oh, okay, where the Maritime Museum uh, is now. Mm-hmm. So he stayed there, and then Dick Parker found out about him, and he wanted him, so he went to work. Dick, when the shop was way down, where almost to the, what do you call it, where the ships come in? The port? Way down there, Mm -hmm. Dick Parker had the shop, and then they moved. So he stayed with him for 21 years, I think. We got a chance to go on the ferry as a mechanic, a diesel mechanic. So, so he worked for the ferry system the last part yeah, of that his was career? Cool. He was there when he had retired. He wanted to retire. He said, there's so much I want to do. Well, they begged him to stay in. And he said, uh, he came home one evening. He said, um, I want to get out. He was, it was 60. He'd been in 60. No, he was 62. He would have gotten $32 more a month. He said, what should I do? I said, well... Get out, you know, you're, we're getting up in age. So he got out, and um, in two weeks he had done everything he wanted to do. And then he was bored to death. <laughs> he said, what am I going to do now? I said, well, I don't know. <laughs> so um, he had been out one year and two months when he died. Oh. So had he stayed in that, if he had passed away within that year, I would have been fixed, but because he stayed in two months too long, I said I could have killed her. <laughs> <laughs> well, how how did you have? How many children did you have with with Black? Four. And and tell me about them. Well, Wendy was the oldest. She well, all of them. All of them had been married. Uh, Kyle, the last one, had just gotten married when Black had died. So uh, he got to see most of the grandchildren. There was only, I think there's only been two or three. I've got eight and two great-grandchildren. Wonderful. And he got to see them all and play with them, enjoy them, except I think the two great-grandchildren and maybe one of the grandchildren. If, if you had your grandchildren or, or one of your grandchildren on your knee and you wanted to tell them a tale about Harker's Island and growing <laughs> up here, what would you tell them? Something... <laughs> Well, all of them, but especially my son, he is like me. I am a, I keep every clipping. I have got plastic containers full of clip, newspaper clippings from wow. when, way, 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 when it was a, the, uh, what did they call it? It wasn't the it, Beaufort News. It was before that. I mean, way, way back then. The Eagle? I don't remember, but I have got boxes of clippings of obituaries and all kinds of things. Wow. But uh, my son is the one that is like me. He wants to know. He'll say, Mama, tell me about the olden days. And I don't know if any, I might have one grandchild that loves to, he wants me to tell him about that. But I kind of shoo him away, not realizing that that's all they'll ever know, I mean, is what I tell them. That's right. That's right. So um, I tried to tell him how, how we didn't know any difference, Connie, because everybody fared alike. Everybody was poor, but we didn't know it. Mm-hmm. As a matter of fact, I don't think we were poor. We were rich in the things that we had. Mm-hmm. We had what we needed. So what if we got our homework by lamplight? 
It was good. I mean, we enjoyed it. We walked to school on the shore. What difference did it make? We got there and got back, and we enjoyed. Now I can carry those memories with me. It's sad that my children won't ever know. The joy of running home, playing on the shore under the net spreads and all that kind of stuff. That now nobody, you can you can think what it might have been like, but you'll never know. Mm-hmm. Even if we had had camcorders or whatever you call them, you still wouldn't have smelt that salt air blowing and stuff like that and seeing the rain come across the water. I was thinking the other night how we used to load the boat, uh, a boat. We didn't have a boat, but our neighbors did. And we'd pile in that boat and go over to Shackerford Banks. And coming home by the moonlight, of course the boats weren't fast, we'd make ice cream sitting on the cab and singing and everything. And it was just a, a good time. Good, good time. Mm. I hate for people talking about they weren't golden years, were they? Yes, they were. I thought they were. And they still, I think, now. I'd like to have it over again. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, Mother would take... We would go to school, and Mother would take the little ones that were left, and she always had a carriage, and she would walk with if there was one or two to Grandma's house, which was down by the school building. And then I we would go there after school and play and play until dark, and then we'd walk home in the pitch black because there were no no street lights. You see a little lamp way through the woods. And the road until I got, I reckon almost in high school, were like clamshells. I mean, it was rocks, the roads were. I remember the evening they started paving the road. We were walking home, and we were on the opposite side of the road, and we walked way, 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 and we could, they wouldn't let us cross because they had poured the, whatever you call it. I don't know if they called it asphalt then. But we had to walk way back and cross the road to go on the other side to get home. <laughs> but all those things I can remember when the ferry came, when the ferry was running, and when the bridge was over here. And I walked to the straits eight years to take piano lessons. You across, walked to the straits? Across the bridge. You walked across the bridge. I learned how to play chopsticks. <laughs> now I couldn't play that anymore. You're so accomplished like me. I now, took now seven years and I can't <laughs> play any but chopsticks. Now they wrote me a piano. <laughs> I knew where Middle C was. <laughs> oh, man. But I couldn't walk. I bet I couldn't walk halfway the island now. I mean, we walked to Shell Point. We'd leave school, and we'd go to Shell Point, which was very seldom because that was the Easter. You didn't go away. That was far, far, far. But we would go down there occasionally and have a hot dog roast to Shell Point because most of our friends were from down that way, Clary Estelle and Annie Bryan and all them. Did you know why it was called Shell Point at that time? Yeah. They tell tell had, me for the record. What I mean, I don't. I remember I asked my uncle just before he passed away in 1994, 95. Um, Lee and Davis, you know, wrote all these, and I've got everyone on um, things about the island. And he said, there's one thing that she didn't write about. And I said, well, he lived in Shelby. He'd come home every summer. And he was home, his wife had died, and we were just sitting in the swing talking. And he said she didn't write about the um, why it was Shell Point. I often wondered if the Indians had enough shells to try to build a road to the banks. Where did they get all those shells? He said that they had great big mounds of shells. They were so big, the mounds were, that the little boys would have caves inside. Mm. They would dig them out and they'd go in, you know, like a big cave. And they would play and, and enjoy. And then there there would be barges come in and pick them up, the shells, and take them off. And also he said that they had a... seemed like to me it was... I don't know where they would have gotten logs. There was something else that he said that they, uh, the ships or the big boats were coming or the Barges would come in and pick it up and take it to Norfolk or somewhere. I don't know if that was could have been trees. I mean, they didn't have logging. I also didn't know that uh, down beyond where my house is at, you know where Madge lives? Mm-hmm. Lived? Well, there was a big field back there. Of course, it's going down. The houses are built over it. But they, uh, they had, I think she said, uh, 
rice. Couldn't be wheat. Could have been. But they had a song, um, windmill and all that mess there where the boat harbor is now by the bridge up that way. Mm-hmm. And he talked about that stuff, which was beyond what I had. I never heard that. It was, I think it was, corn, what they ground in the windmill was corn. Was it? But, um, it could, I mean, you know, I'm not to say because I don't know, but, you know, this is a great place to, to do rice, too, you know, with the flooding and everything. But uh, Joel Hancock had told me about uh, over there where Ann Max, the Maxwell land is uh-huh. over there, that that's where that windmill was. Well, now, by the time I got up where I was old enough to, to wander, I used to, because grandmother would walk along the shore, with a, a bushel sack, bushel, what do you call it, sacks. And she'd walk, and we would walk across that, where the harbor is now, you could walk across that. Hmm. And she'd go in Tom Sparks' creek, they called it, and get oysters and put them on her back and tote them all the way down all those, you know, along the shore. But I don't ever remember seeing a windmill or anything like that. Yeah, it was, so probably, it was gone. probably gone by then. But the stones are still there, so Joel tells me. And I've asked <clears throat> permission uh, to go over there and find them and photograph them and measure them. And everything. Who would you go and take? Uh, Miss The Maxwells, because they own that property now. Well, don't Kenny Willis's wife still, isn't she the caretaker there? I don't know, but Judy? Ka- Karen's going to find out. I mean, she's going to contact I know Judy would her. probably let yeah. you do it. She and uh, so um, Karen's gonna get me the permission to go over there. So something. Yeah, I remember when Mr. Johnson was co. I mean, he was the um, coordinator. What do you call people to take care of other people's property? <laughs> Caretaker. He drove the school bus. Caretaker. Mr. Johnson did, and he had a son, um, Ella Johnson. I don't know what she is now. She lives over there in Smyrna. Mm-hmm. What, is, what was her husband? Uh, Umpy, what was his name? Her Umpy? <laughs> <laughs> but um, we would go over there to play, but that end, the very end, we called it, um, what did we call it? But it was like off limits to us. That was where the pilgrims, they said, was supposed to have landed or something. <laughs> there was a half sunken great big boat down there and all that. Oh, really? Oh, on Harker's Island? At the, on the point. On the point where, um, where the Dennis, the Dennis is. Sure, I know where I know. Well, that's probably the same thing you're talking about, Joel. It's the same area. Mm-hmm, you know? mm-hmm. We called it, what did we call it? The Plymouth Sutley. Anyway, there's a big hull of a boat there that the water would wash up in it, you know. Mm. It, and it finally rotted it down. I guess the Dennis just destroyed it when they, because there was two or three great big millionaires that bought it, I think, before Dennis got it. I don't remember. Mm-hmm. Had a lot of changes. That's the reason I tell the crowd that I said the islanders don't come here to our museum because they think it's always going to be here, but it don't always happen that way. Had I, I've always been interested in my forefathers and what they did, especially my grandfather, great grandfather, or whoever, being from Ireland. I've always mm-hmm. wondered do I have cousins in Ireland? But because he came here the way he did, there's no kind or anything that I could ever find any well, how, what, about. how did he come here? Grandmother always told me that he came on a freighter from Ireland. And the boat's the ship landed in Wilmington. And he got off. He was like a stowaway. And he wandered from Wilmington because the women here, and I guess other communities, went where they were building roads to do the cooking and the washing for the men. Mm-hmm. They weren't married, but they weren't cockabines either. They just went, you know. I guess the county. They were making and, a living. Yeah. But I remember her talking about when they were up around. Um, they didn't call it Jacksonville or Swan. I don't know, but we used to call it Bear Creek. It was up that way, and it was communities out off the main highway. We used to go up to visit. We had companies, the Yeoman's families, or my families. Grandmother Davis, well, Yeoman she was. But um, that he was helping to build. He was on the road crew, you know. So he, he and Lucy, or no, Jean. They, their house was up where Tom Sparks' house is now. Mm-hmm. That's where they lived. 
that um, I remember Uncle Guy, the one I was telling you about earlier, he told me about grandmother. Um, they would come up, they, the sawmills were at Lenoxville, that, that way, and they they washed and fed the men, you know, there were big groups of them mm-hmm. that went with the, the road crew. To, so I guess that's where he just migrated on down, you know. And, so he met her during yeah. that that time? Yeah. And uh, and and stayed on Parker's Island. Yep. And what was his name? Timothy. Timothy. Timothy Sullivan. Sullivan. Good old Irish so if that name. Ain't Irish name. <laughs> Whew, you can't get any more Irish than that. <laughs> no more Irish than that. <laughs> Daddy died wanting to know uh, if I just knew for sure. You know what was what. But. Well, now as as a Mormon, <clears throat> I, I would have thought that you would try to do that. Right? How have we done it? We've done everything. The only thing that we have traced went to Wilmington. We found even found a house, and the the John Sullivan that we have found in the records there. He and his wife. His wife was named Lucy. No, his yeah, it was Lucy. Which we think that maybe when they had Grandmother Lucy, that they named her for her. Mm-hmm, you know? mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But there's just no way of proving. Or, or, and Grandmother said that she was the oldest of three girls. They lived up there where Tom's eyes is. She was the oldest and she was only eight. Well, see, they didn't keep records. And even the Bible said just had birth date and death date. They didn't write nothing, you know. Well, grandmother, great, well, I call her grandmother, Jane, um, Mama's mother. Mama was eight, and she had to clam, go clamming, because they didn't have no welfare and all that stuff. You couldn't get it off the land. You didn't get it. She would fill her little skiff. She had a little skiff, and she would pull. That's the reason I, the grandmother used to talk about how narrow that stretch of water was, where the bridge is now. She'd pull her little skiff across that little inlet that little strip of water, to stretch and tote the clams to a little place at the road there where they bought seafood. That was where, and if you didn't, of course they always had gardens up there. Tom Spark said that he always had big gardens. But um, you had to get stuff out of the water Mm -hmm. if you lived. Mm -hmm. I had a, um, well it was Papa Joe, Daddy's father, his um, one of his sisters, her husband died with severe arthritis or something. They lived to Shackleford Banks, and she had like seven or eight children, and she was sickly herself all the time. That she writes, I've got it in my history stuff, that she had to wrap her children in the sailboat canvases to keep them warm. It was, I mean, they just didn't have anything. She took them out of the boats and, and put the canvases in the house and carried the canvases in the house to wrap the children. They didn't have nothing. Mm-hmm. And like I said, if you didn't have a little collar patch or something. And I remember when I read Karen's first mailboat book about Aunt Mary, so she was my family too. And how they went, Christmas was coming, and how they'd go in the woods, the little boys would and pull the, the wool off the briars where the lambs and their sheep had been. So the moms could do little things to make little toys or clothes or whatever. Mm-hmm. But it, was, it, was, it was rough. Mm. But they died before they realized that there was an easier way. Mm. So, we, so. We've got it pretty good, don't we? I think we've got it made in the shade. <laughs> well, listen, I want to thank you so much. I could talk to you for hours and I hours could talk and hours. For <laughs> <laughs> That's like the little boy just came home off his mission. Yeah, Dana, Lisa's boy. Lisa told me before he came in, she had talked to him on the internet, whatever, and he said, uh, she said, what do you, Jordan, what do you want when you get home? She thought he'd say shrimp or whatever. He said, Ma, I want to go in my bedroom, lock the door, and sleep for 24 hours straight. I mean, they have it rough. In, in Mexico, it's rough. He said, and I don't want to ever see another tomato in my life. <laughs> He had his own tomatoes. So, I mean, there's, so, there's, there's, there's poor places still in the world. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, we don't know how good we have it. But I want to thank you again. And, and, oh, and, uh, um, if my children are in history, I'll send them, send them here. Send them here. And we'll, yeah, and that's the wonderful thing about these tapes, you know, the, between the park and, and the Corsam Museum. 
you know, we're, we'll digitize these. They'll be available to everybody. So. Well, what I started to say just now before I drifted off on something else, I tell the people, take your children. If they're older, send their children with their children to the museum. I said, because everything down there is something that belonged to a relative centuries ago, I reckon. Yeah. But they didn't know what to do with it, so they put it down there for safekeeping. I mean, and if you've got sense enough to realize that was your great, great, great grandfather's, and his fingers touched that. I look at things back there, and I've never been all over it, but I go back there and think about their hands have been on that piece of equipment, crippled hands. Like Stacy Gather, he was my husband's family. Mm-hmm. And you've not got sense enough you're letting it lay there. And I want pictures of my children with that stuff. Right, right. So. Well, listen, let, uh, talk about pictures. Let's, all, let's go in there and take a picture of you. No, no. Yeah, no. I got to have a picture. Look at me. I know my hair is a you're mess. You're beautiful. Come on <laughs> yeah, now. Okay, well, thank you, and we'll turn this off.